Hello and welcome to Veterans Remember. My name is Dick Gooding, Hopkin and Veteran and your host of Veterans Remember. On the show, we talk to Hopkin and Veterans, young and old, who have proudly served our country in wartime and in peace. Hopkinen has rich heritage of military service, and our veterans' experiences have helped to shape our nation through the years. These conversations are chronicled on Veterans Remember, broadcast on HCAM TV, and available in our schools and libraries for all Hopkintonians, particularly for our school-aged children who don't get the opportunity. Veterans Remember is also now in the archives at the Library of Congress, as well as at the Army Heritage Foundation. Joining us today on Veterans Remember is Ted Hoyt, who is a, a veteran from, uh, actually from Framingham, grew up in Framingham and has lived in Hopkinton for the past number of years. Ted, I'd like to welcome you to Veterans Remember. Thank you, thank you for having me. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, about your youth and uh, how you wound up getting into the service as well. Well, as you say, I was uh, raised in Framingham. I lived there uh, most of my life, moved there when I was about two. Um, my dad was a, uh, a graduate of the Man Maritime Academy, was a Naval Reserve officer, uh, was not while well, we were kids, but uh, kind of maintained that uh, military discipline, I guess. Used to have inspections. Uh, and um, my younger brother and I both joined the military, went to the service academies. He went to Navy and I was Army. Uh, my older brother went to Brown, and uh, he's the civilian of the family. How did you, you know, the decision to go to the academy, both for you and your younger brother, is not an easy decision and a lengthy process. Uh, how did that get uh, started? Uh, it was an easy decision for me. It was made by my parents, <laughs> primarily. Uh, I had intended to goof off in college. Uh, but uh, my mom actually filled out my application for me. And uh, when I got accepted, um, you know, they, they made a good sales pitch. And I was always a, kind of a, I always, you know, uh, liked the military. I used to play the little tanks as a, you know, uh, the little model tanks as a kid. And I had been a, a, a Boy Scout for a long time. and so. Uh, it just ended up that I, I said okay. You know, they put a little squeeze on me, and uh, and and I said okay, and and it ended up being a very, I think, in the long run, I think it was a very good decision. Uh, yeah, and who uh, sponsored you from uh, Congress or Senator? Barney Frank. Barney Frank. Yeah, I actually, uh, I'd never met him. Yeah. Uh, I ran into him at a party a few years ago, and. Uh, told him that he had been my sponsor and he, you know of course he didn't remember anything and you know he, he actually made the point of well he didn't think that you know the congress should be involved and i i disagreed we ended up having a big fist fight um <laughs> no i i but i you know I, I thought about it and i told him i said well i think it's important i think it's important that the government be perceived as mm -hmm. supporting uh you know he may not be he may be a pacifist he may not be a big but the you know I, I really think that it's important that uh, Congress remain involved in, in that sure. process. And well, and I think in many instances, the staffers wind up doing all the vetting and doing all the work, sure. and it's a, a yeah. congressman's name that gets lent to the process, but they may not participate as much as you'd like to think they would. Yeah. yeah. No, he didn't participate at all, as far as I know, but <laughs> that's all right. And how were your West Point years? Uh, varied. Uh, I actually had uh, my first year, plebe year, uh, I enjoyed quite a bit. Uh, my second two years, I was under the gun a little bit. I had gotten in some trouble and, uh, you know, was kind of under pressure. Um, I had been in trouble the whole time, actually. I was a century man. Um, well, that's not an unusual uh, thing for uh, people who go to West Point. Yeah, and, and then my senior century year. Century man, you're, you're going to need to explain that. Uh, that means you have over 100 hours of punishment. Uh, punishment you know. tours walk in the area. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then uh, senior year, I loved it. Uh, you know, I, they gave us a car. And well, they didn't give us a car, but we could have a car and um, kind of escape. But overall, I think, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, enjoyed the experience. It took me a while to realize that uh, after sure. I got out. Uh, you know, I had stayed away for a good 10 years. 
uh, went back, ended up uh, marrying a, a, a gal that was uh, fifth generation. Her grandfather was fifth generation West Point, so got reintroduced to West Point at that mm -hmm. point, um, you know, through her grandfather, who was a distinguished graduate there. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of realized, oh, it wasn't such a bad place after all. Maybe memory lets the, the heart. So what, what kind of assignment and what were your branch when you left uh, West Point? Uh, when I left, I was uh, branched air defense artillery, mm -hmm. and I went to Korea. Um, I actually chose air defense uh, in order to go to Korea. It gave me the best chance of, of going to Korea. Cause Korea, that's when I was uh, coming out of school, Korea wasn't uh, number, number one on many people's choice. Uh, curious choice, why, uh, why Korea? I think it was just kind of the adventure, the excitement of, of going someplace to foreign land and have a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't want to say you get as far away from everything as, as, you know, but just the adventure of it, I think, was probably what motivated me. What did you do in Korea? I was in the air defense. Um, I had uh, uh, two different types of platoons. I was a platoon leader for Chaparral, which is a short-range air defense missile, um, uh, anti-aircraft missile, and also a platoon leader for uh, Vulcan, which is a, an air defense uh, Gatling gun. It's a uh, six-barrel, 20-millimeter, uh, you know, this basically a huge machine gun. Uh, that is for short range air defense. So, mm -hmm. you know, to. to when we were, uh, during that period of time, we weren't at war as we have been for the past number of years. Uh, I assume that Korea probably got some of the new equipment or some of the modern, uh, more modern things uh, since they were as close to being at war as anyone. Is that, uh, is that the case? It, it may have been. Uh, you know, I. Uh, memory fades, but, you know, we were well equipped. We were, mm -hmm. uh, my uh, battery was near Freedom Bridge, and um, we were assigned to protect the bridge for as long as it took for the infantry to come back across in the event of a, uh, uh, in the event of some type of Freedom Bridge attack. has a history to it. Could you explain for, uh, for our audience a little bit about that? Well, it, it's, uh, as far as I know, and you may know the history better than I, but uh, it's, there's just a little pocket of, of South Korean and NATO um, uh, forces on the other side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the nickname would, I think, come from the fact that that was kind of the bastion of freedom sure. that was, was there forward in, in the Panmunjom, the, the uh, forward area there, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it was in order to defend freedom, yeah. I, you know, and <laughs> I'm sorry, sure. Dick, if you know. Oh, oh, oh no, you, I don't, I can't add anything to that, believe me. Uh, after you uh, left Korea, uh, you came back stateside? I did. I came to Georgia. I was in uh, uh, Savannah mm -hmm. area and stayed in the air defense for about a year, a year and a half there. Um, what was the mission at uh, Fort Stewart? I, I, it, again, it wasn't wartime, um, so we just had training. We used to go to the uh, but National it was an Training Center. It was an, an air defense battery. Yeah, it was actually mm -hmm. the, the Fort Stewart was a um, was a division oh, okay. of you know, so it had everything, including air defense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we just did training there. Uh, occasionally we'd go to California to do our, uh, at the National Training Center where, you know, you gear up with miles, uh, the, the laser uh, simulation equipment and have the, the you know, training there. And, uh, and then I joined uh, Special Forces. I applied for Special Forces from there. Why did you uh, make that decision? I don't really remember, but uh, my my brother was joining the SEALs at the same time. I, I got see. The, uh, and there's an ongoing dispute as to who thought of it first. Uh, he had been at the Naval Academy and, and joined the SEALs straight out of the Academy, but that was three years after. So we ended up in the Special Forces around the same time. I think I thought of it first, but we ended up in training around the same time, too. Um, Again, probably just for the adventure. Yeah. But. And uh, your, your 
special forces training was done down at Fort Bragg? It was at Fort Bragg, yeah. yeah. I was there for a total of two years, which included mm -hmm. the language. Uh, we did six months of immersion training. Uh, they taught me Russian there. I've forgotten all of it now. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I, my class would have been about a year, but I recycled. <clears throat> I had a, a bad ankle at one point, and they sent me to the uh, psychological officer course, the PSYOP course there, you know, fill in, my fill recycle. Fill in some time before the recycling? Yeah, yeah. To, to, to fill in time there. So now, did was, you wind up with a special forces assignment upon uh, completion of your training? Yep, yeah, I came up here to Fort Devens mm -hmm. in, in Massachusetts, just north of us, and uh, was there um, probably from 90 uh, to 94 when I ended up really kind of getting out of the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that's the uh, 10th Special Forces Group or 10th Mountain yep. Division. What, what uh, 10th, 10th Group. <coughs> uh, mm -hmm. And I think we ended up, after I had gotten out, they moved to Colorado. I, I think they might have been there with the 10th Mountain Division as well, but it was separate. It was the 10th Special Forces Group. And how big a, an, an organization was, this, was the 10th Special Forces Group? Uh, well, we had uh, three battalions. Um, All of them right there at uh, Devons? No, uh, we had one battalion forward in Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the two battalions there would have been, if I, this is a long time ago, um, I think the, the battalion would consist of three or four companies, three, three companies. Sure which would have been six teams each. So um, each battalion would have been 18 teams. Uh, and then we had two battalions there, and I wanted 36 teams. Yeah. Um, now, while you were in the Special Forces, that sort of <clears throat> took you away from air defense artillery. Is that correct or not? You rebranched. It, okay. it had kind of changed. It, it used to be kind of like a subspecialty, but mm -hmm. then I think in the early 80s or, or mid 80s, they made special forces a separate branch of the army. So mm -hmm. it was just like air defense or armor or infantry. It would, you know, so when I graduated from the, the qualification course, I was in a completely separate branch of the army. But it's, and it certainly retained its uh, elite status as a, uh, as a fighting a fighting organization with the army. I tell people that. Yes. What's that? I, that's what I say. That's what I say. My <laughs> but your brother, a who's a SEAL, probably uh, had yeah, different yeah. feelings about They're that. Right. Tell us a little bit about your assignments as a Special Forces uh, officer. Uh, well, yeah. uh, we did go to Iraq a couple times. I, I spent a total of about seven months between Interlake, Turkey, and Iraq, northern Iraq. I, uh, you know, 10th Group was assigned to. Now, this uh, is certainly well before 9 11. It was and and Very so different we world. weren't the, we weren't at war, but uh, yet we yeah. had a presence. Was that presence a, a silent presence, or was it well no. known? No, no, it was well known. It was actually after the first Gulf War. Okay. Uh, in other words, the the after the invasion of Kuwait, mm -hmm. uh, there had been that coalition effort mm -hmm. to oust um, uh, Saddam Hussein from uh, Kuwait, and also. As a kind of a byproduct of that, and again, memory fades, but uh, they established kind of a, an autonomous uh, area in northern Iraq for the Kurdish people, who had been really the subject of uh, some persecution. Mm -hmm. uh, so the I think the Kurds in the Iraqi Kurds uh, used the opportunity of Saddam being weakened to establish their autonomy there. And we went to uh, provide, it. there was a no-fly zone that was established, and we had a very limited physical presence in, in northern Iraq. Uh, I had three of my guys went in and lived there. They weren't happy about it, but we kind of said, you have to you know, go sure. to this house. And this, this house you know, was secured. It had an outer security of, of Kurdish um, militia. Uh, so, you know, it, it was never attacked uh, while we were there. And, and, uh, but it consisted of three of my guys, two other um, in U.S. In native garb or, or in uh, regular no, they, military? No, they were in, in uniform. Mm -hmm. 
And um, we also had, uh, I think, three French, three British, three Turks, um, you know, were there, and they called it the Military Coordination Center, and they were the only people that lived in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And then we would come, uh, whether if it, if there was some specific mission, um, you know, uh, there was one kind of funny one. I think I told Hank about there that well, the tell us the, about it, the aircraft crash, but we would have specific missions mm -hmm. and and then also we would come as a show of force and we'd just kind of drive around in our Humvees. They'd let school out, you know, I've got a, a neat picture of the, the kids getting let out of school. We were kind of their heroes. But the one, uh, the one story was that, you know, an Air Force guy uh, was going to the bathroom in his jet or, you know, uh, over Iraq and uh, apparently got his seatbelt stuck in the, the throttle stick and crashed, <laughs> um, crashed this, you know, multi-million dollar jet. And we went, so we loaded up in helicopters. We didn't know he had been, he ended up being recovered by the, the Kurdish militia, mm -hmm. um, which were friendly to us. And so he was never in any real danger. But we didn't know that, so we, we hurried um, to deploy and, you know, to try to initially recover. We were, our primary mission there was to support the no-fly zone, which is, you know, a search and rescue type. Uh, and then the second mission was kind of show of force. Uh, but we went in and actually that's the w one of two times I, we got shot at. I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, we, we couldn't figure out who was shooting at us. There was a lot of tracer fire, it was nighttime. Uh, one of the helicopters actually got hit, and they, uh, but it wasn't mine. It was my boss's, um, but no one was hurt. And uh, we actually think it was probably the, or I think it was probably the Kurdish Turk resistance thinking that we were Turks, because we couldn't figure out who would be, you know, we, the Iraqi agents were there. They arrested a few, you know, that were planning attacks and mm -hmm. things like that while we were there. Uh, in you know they wanted to destabilize this autonomous region and the, and we were the symbol of that, um, but the the um, I, I'm guessing it was the Kurd uh, resistance thinking that we were Turks because there's obviously a lot of confusion as to who's fighting who there, but we went in and um, ended up going to this uh, secure site that the uh, the MCC that and then sending guys after to try to recover uh, the aircraft, to destroy the aircraft. Sure. There was some classified stuff that they needed to, to destroy. And that, that's a good example of, of, you know, the Kurds really, at that point at least, and I think most of them still to this day, really appreciated our being there and were, were truly friendly. So we ended up sending some guys forward. It was a very mountainous region where this aircraft had crashed. Sure. And uh, we had set up uh, sent two guys up onto a hilltop uh, to set up a communications link, and it was miserable pouring rain. And uh, this group of villagers comes and approaches, you know, these uh, these two guys that are sitting on the hilltop. Sure. Um, you know, and at first, of course, they're wondering, hey, who the heck are these guys coming up the hill towards us? And it ended up being that they had brought a tarp up, and, and four of the uh, you know four of the villagers were holding the tarp over these guys, while the the village elders were you know feeding them dates and cracking nuts for them, and you know stayed there the whole day in the pouring rain, uh, you know, and that that was one thing I came away with too. A lot of times it was it was cold up there, yeah. and uh, we had this Kurdish militia that was our outer security wherever we went. And they'd be, you know, in, in the forward Humvees uh, and, you know, they'd be sitting up on the rooftops and I was freezing with the, the heater inside <laughs> and these guys didn't have the same kind of gear as we did. And, uh, you know, they never complained. They, they were some pretty tough. Yeah. Tough and these customers. were deployments that were out of Fort Devens and you wind up uh, going to various places. Other yep. places other than uh, the Kurdish area of Iraq, other deployments? Uh, they sent us a couple of times to Russia. Really? Uh, what, was, what was your role there? Well, I'm not really sure to this day. <laughs> it was during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, I, if I had to guess, I think I'd, I'd guess that they were uh, kind of using us to test what was going on, to, to see what was. Mm -hmm. We went as uh, students 
uh, we didn't go in uniform and we declared on our visas that we were students. Um, not sure I should talk about much of this, but we didn't do anything, you know, we didn't do anything sure. funny on spying or anything like that, although some people encouraged us to try to do so. But we went and, and I think we were just trying to find out what was really going on. And uh, one story out of that was we were on a train, uh, you know, kind of an overnight train from Moscow, or not Moscow, St. Petersburg is where we kind of lived. Um, and we were heading down to uh, Latvia. We were heading down to Riga, Latvia. And uh, at the border at about 3 a.m. after, you know, spending some time in the dining car drinking vodka, uh, people woke us up with machine guns and said, you know, get off the train. <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it was winter time and it was snow and there was no, nothing in sight, but, you know, they had machine guns and we didn't. So we got off the train, they just loaded us out into the snow. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of the guide that we had, the, the Russian point of contact was mm -hmm. with us on the trip. And he later explained that our visas were only a single entry visa. And because no one really knew at the time that we were coming over that, you know, Latvia was going to be considered a separate country. So I think just that day they decided that they weren't going to accept these, you know, Soviet visas mm -hmm. anymore and uh, led us to, you know, a couple mile trudge through the snow in the middle of the night, but we didn't mind. We had, had a, yeah. a little left So after over. your special forces experiences, you uh, decided to leave the service uh, after nine yep. years of active duty. Uh, was that a hard decision? No. Uh, my team time was, was done both, you know, in terms of I was just done with the, you know the kind of the exciting part of leading mm -hmm. a special forces team and and then I had also been uh, on one of these uh, parachute jumps they used to make us do uh, training jumps to keep current and some of them had to be like night equipment jumps and uh, this one particular equipment jump where uh, we were pushing pallets on a very small drop zone that nobody knew in the middle of the night and somebody had gotten on the wrong side of the airplane, like just, you know, it's just kind of confusion loading up and this numbskull, you know, made, made the other side have, uh, you know, seven people and our side had nine. Mm -hmm. And so we had like a seven second drop zone and we decided, you know, rather than abort and you can't cross sides, uh, we would just all go out on top of each other. Um, and I was, you know, leading the way, uh, you know, so I went out right on top of the guy and his parachute hit me in the head and kind of knocked me out a little bit. And then, I, you know, I was okay then, but my, my neck started hurting and it ended up being a cyst that was bleeding in my neck. Oh. So they had surgery, did a little, uh, down over here at Mass General, luckily, um, and did a little bit of nerve damage and, you know, and then I wouldn't have been qualified to yeah. stay anyways. And at the same time, they were offering a year's pay to, oh, uh, to for my year group. Sure. And I, I took the year's pay, and I went off and spent it. Well, and, and uh, you went to law school. And I think an interesting uh, uh, story for our viewers is that, uh, you know, having the opportunity to have a paid-for law, law school uh, is, a, is a real benefit for those of us who sure. served. I know I went to grad school on the GI Bill. and. And uh, that's a great experience, and I'm sure, I'm sure that helped you too. Yeah, I, I had run out of money. I was uh, in Texas uh, doing horse wrangling on, on on the beach in Corpus Christi, and was completely broke. And deciding whether or not I wanted to live the bohemian life, or <laughs> you know, kind of rejoin society. Um, and uh, they had offered, they had made this offer to go to school anywhere. Since I think they've tightened it a little bit, but. I could do anything, and I was not really qualified for anything other than lawyering. Um, so they sent me to law school, and I went to law school down in St. Pete, Florida, and uh, met my wife there, and that was it. We well, we're up. certainly glad that you decided to come to Hopkins and Ted and, and your family, and I know you're going to have a very positive experience uh, uh, with your kids growing up in Hopkins, and like so many of us did. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of uh, Veterans Remember uh, for your participation and for you joining us today and, and explaining some of your experiences. 
Uh, anything else you'd like to share with us before? No. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No? I, I appreciate it. And it, okay. it did go quick, just like you said. <laughs> well, we uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us today on Veterans Remember. And uh, we've had a great discussion with Ted Hoyt. And uh, Ted, who's lived in town for, what, 10 or 15 years now? 10, yeah. 10 years, and is raising his family here and uh, given us a great opportunity to learn about uh, experiences, not necessarily during wartime, but uh, certainly in, in a war-like experiences uh, in Iraq and in, in the Kurdish area of Iraq and uh, certainly in Russia. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, joining us on Veterans Remember, and we hope that you'll share these stories uh, with your grandchildren and uh, appreciate it and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Dick. HCAM TV showing movies? That's right. Dive in Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews. And point out some of the reasons these are classic B films. So check out the HCAM TV website at HCAM.TV for movie names and showtimes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV.